thank you, Elia, for inviting me. And my apologies, my font changed uh, in this computer. Uh, so I hope it will be fine. But actually, I want to start with um, a moment of appreciation, uh, being humble and um, enormously grateful for an evolutionary event that happened about a billion and a half years ago uh, when mitochondria uh, were created. It didn't start initially as mitochondria, it started with an intracellular bacterium that entered into the developing uh, cell uh, and resulted, resulted in a beautiful symbiosis uh, that happened between the cell and this bacteria. I started Minovia about 11 years ago. I'm a biochemist by education, um, and I realized how important and fundamental these amazing organelles are. Uh, and we set a, a mission to the company uh, to bring energy restoring and life-changing therapies to patients through the curative potential of mitochondria themselves. And again, we have to be humble. I, I will try in this talk, I have a full presentation of our results, et cetera, and I will touch uh, on them. Uh, but I would like also to, to respect some of the comments that came uh, yesterday and today about really the ability to reverse aging um, or to bring longer, healthy li lifespan to uh, humans, knowing that it is such a complex biological uh, situation or event, the aging. We have seen the updated 12 hallmarks of aging as uh, they were presented, and it's quite clear that it's not enough to target one of them. Uh, we are completely in love with mitochondria, and as scientists, everyone sees his very uh, narrowed uh, aspect uh, of the field. Sometimes it's a single protein, sometimes it's a single uh, organelle or a cell type that we are interested in. Um, but really, I think, try to be um, uh, to, to make sure that you are not seeing just one little bit of it, because it is very complex and, um, and we need to remember that. So mitochondria originally, as I mentioned, they were bacteria that entered into the developing cell. And actually we have to appreciate that life on earth could never happen without this amazing event, because cell could not survive in the high oxygen environment. Uh, and once by, uh, mitochondria uh, were created, they could actually use the oxygen that we breathe uh, to produce the energy together with the nutrients, of course. Um, so it's a, it's a really a tremendous and enormous event uh, that happened. We are all inheriting mitochondria only from our mothers. So the, the amount of mitochondria in the oocyte during the fertilization will be the same mitochondria that will carry out uh, throughout the entire creation of the human body. And this is amazing, I think. And it's, it's quite uh, uh, challenging to detect mitochondrial mutations because uh, there are tens to hundreds of mitochondria in every cell, almost every cell in the body, by the way. There is one special cell population that does not carry mitochondria, which is our red blood cells. They have a other huge responsibility, which is to deliver the oxygen uh, to all the tissues. And if they would have mitochondria, they would actually consume all the oxygen on the way to the tissues. So you don't uh, let the, the, the kitty <laughs> preserve the, uh, the milk. Um, so this is one of the reasons why red blood cells don't have uh, mitochondria. But mitochondria have, um, I, of course I didn't mention it, but they produce most of the cellular energy demands, but that's not the only thing that they do. For example, although red blood cells do not have mitochondria, they contain hemoglobin. And the heme molecule that produces the, the, that composes the hemoglobin is actually produced by the mitochondria in the reticulocytes before they are forming uh, the erythrocytes. Uh, so mitochondria produce energy, they produce hemoglobin, they produce he uh, um, steroid hormones, both sex hormones, mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, they control calcium homeostasis, nucleic acid synthesis, free fatty acids, and they are actually controlling life and death because apoptosis, which is the, um, the cell uh, machinery to commit suicide, is also controlled by the mitochondria. So it's all about life and death. And this is why I decided to <laughs> give my life to this organelle. Uh, but in a, I mean, when we started Minovia, we were very uh, naive thinking we can just replace mitochondria in all the body with a very simple question. Can this mitochondria or this organelle still have the ability to re-enter cells like they did during evolution? And if they can, well, that's easy. Let's just replace 
uh, the, the bad and damaged or aged mitochondria with healthy and functional ones. But just remember, almost three, uh, 300 trillion cells composing our bodies, and except for red blood cells and maybe some uh, lens cells in the eye, all of them have tens to hundreds of mitochondria and so many copies of mitochondrial DNA in each one of them. That's not possible, let's just admit it. And since we started 11 years ago, and we also, like other companies that today exist, we thought we will just inject mitochondria to humans. Uh, we actually, uh, about seven years ago, went back and said, well, that probably is not going to be possible. Mitochondria are not supposed to be outside cells. The conditions that needs to control their integrity and function are not those that cells like, okay? It's not the serum or the media that is in our body that will preserve their function. So we have to be careful about what we are aiming. And this is why we took a different approach in Minovia to enrich cells with mitochondria. And I will show you how. So this is the complexity of a person suffering a mitochondrial dysfunction. Again, all the mitochondria in the body, which results in every organ system that is deteriorated. We can see this in primary mitochondrial diseases. They are the best model, by the way, in our eyes, to study age-related mitochondrial dysfunction. There are diseases where children are born with mutations in the mitochondrial DNA that results in multisystemic diseases with visual impairments, with hearing loss, with dementia, with epilepsy, with uh, stroke-like episodes, with diabetes, uh, kidney insufficiency, you name it, bone marrow failures. Those are diseases that we know from aging, right? So they appear in uh, those mitochondrial uh, diseases. And there are no approved therapies for those diseases. They are considered rare, and I want to talk about it in a second. Uh, what are the outcomes of a disease that is uh, mentioned as a rare or an orphan indication by the regulatory authorities? It means there are no available therapies. Those are life-threatening conditions, which mean there are accelerated pathways for approval of drugs. And I think that if we want to develop therapies for uh, life-threatening age-related diseases, we should change the mindset of the regulatory authorities. We should have the right to try for patients in ages or with such devastating diseases for technologies that are on the way and not yet may be approved, but have shown to be safe. So Minovia, as I mentioned, we took a step back from ju just let's uh, directly inject mitochondria to people. Uh, and we said, let's do mitochondrial augmentation technology, uh, which is to enrich cells uh, with mitochondria, ex vivo, okay? Um, so there are different cell types that we can use to enrich. We can improve, for example, CAR T cells, loading them with healthy and functional mitochondria. Uh, we can uh, load mesenchymal stem cells. There are several benefits of doing that or we can use hematopoietic stem cells. So I started as a big fan of mitochondria and turned to be a big, big fan of hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and the reason is because those stem cells can actually re, uh, regenerate the whole blood system, including the immune system. And we just heard how important the immune system is in maintaining blood vessels or in uh, removing senescent cells. And there are so many others, of course, we have seen during COVID how important it is to maintain your immune system because then uh, you can uh, much easier overcome an infection, of course. We use mitochondria from the youngest source, uh, youngest, healthiest, uh, that just a minute ago supported the baby, uh, which is the placenta. Yeah, Minovia started in Rehovot, and I used, I'm living in Haifa, and I used to travel by train, and one of these tra uh, train uh, uh, long travels, uh, a person sits next to me and asks me, what do I do? So I told him I'm <laughs> developing therapies based on placenta. And he asked, do you know what a placenta is? And I said, of course I know. And I said, no, no, no. Placenta in Hebrew, the word is shilia. And he said, it's actually shelia. It's divine. It belongs to God. That's the meaning of this word. And this is how re respectful we are when we receive these placentas uh, from operation rooms uh, and we use them to enrich cells. Uh, the green labeled mitochondria here are those that we were introduced into the cells, very hard to have enough cells harboring this exogenous mitochondria. So think about if we just inject them to the blood, well, whether they will uh, enter the cells or not, they will probably not. It's very hard to control that. 
There were another reason why there are no approved therapies for mitochondrial disease. It's not just there were no ways to rescue or restore mitochondrial function, but there were no ways to measure mitochondrial dysfunction. I assume you know that when you feel bad, no one measures your mitochondrial activity. And that has to change, okay? So we are part of a consortium called the Liquid uh, BX, uh, which is supported by the Israeli Innovation Authority to develop these specific blood biomarkers for mitochondrial dysfunction in multiple diseases. Uh, we are looking at healthy young individual versus the, our positive control, of course, which is primary mitochondrial diseases, and try, try, then trying to see what is the score, the mito index, and how can we uh, look at diseases such as Alzheimer's or age-related, for example, and, and score them according to the mitochondria. And there are many different functions of mitochondria and content and activity and mutation loads in the mitochondrial DNA that we can uh, put together in this uh, score of mitochondria that we can uh, then uh, generate. This is in the future, of course. So we can really restore mitochondrial function in cells. These are cells, disease cells that we rescue the growth of these cells. We can rescue the protein synthesis uh, by augmenting cells with mitochondria. But most importantly, and this is where I will uh, probably stop because I don't have enough time to talk further. As I mentioned, we enrich hematopoietic stem cells with mitochondria. This is a personalized cell therapy approach. We have a bank, the first in the world bank of allogeneic cryopreserved mitochondria for placentas, qualified placental mitochondria. Uh, but that's not enough. This is our way of scaling up the production, and we do that. But eventually, if we need to collect the hematopoietic stem cells from the patient and enrich them in a GMP facility, a clean room, uh, in a grade that is suitable for clinical use, that means at least four patients walking, four people walking in the clean room, four people qualifying the, the product at the end, at least two people working on the quality assurance of this whole process, and that's going to be a very expensive product and not highly scalable. This is just rejuvenating the immune system. This is just rejuvenating the hematopoietic system. If we want to further deliver mitochondria on and on throughout the body to every person on earth, because we are all going to age eventually, right, and develop a mitochondrial disease, we have to solve these very complex issues. And that's going to cost a lot of money. And I will remind you again, this is just mitochondrial dysfunction. And as important it is, we do believe it's super important, but that's not the only thing that causes us to age. And we have to remember that. So it's going to be expensive. I mean, now we have so far raised tens of millions of dollars, and that's not enough even to uh, finish the development to a single primary mitochondrial disease of 100 patients in the world. It's going to be very expensive. But we all need to do that, right? This is why we are here uh, and we are devoting our life to this. And looking at these patients that were treated, 12 patients so far, we could actually observe that this therapy was continuing the development. In. And this is why we are continuing with the next generation products. And hopefully we can take that further to the clinic and into clinical trials. Um, and, and succeed with our huge mission on earth, <laughs> which is uh, to deliver this mitochondrial augmentation technology to as many patients as possible. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you very much. Super inspiring. Uh, so may, maybe about your next uh, thoughts about your next uh, scaling up of this technology. Would do you have in mind any any possible solutions for this scaling up, to democratizing this technology as a rejuvenation later? That's one. And the second is uh, using hematopoietic stem cells is is wonderful for anything blood related. But does that revive? And and in the previous lecture we've seen that. Uh, working with the blood and the vascular system that would make sense it would rejuvenate the entire body yet yeah, there are many tissues that uh, can only go that far and you would like to re rejuvenate the mitochondria over there so do you have any thoughts about that yes yeah, so briefly <laughs> so we'll be in time so the first 12 patients were treated with maternal derived mitochondria so even more personalized so we are out from that scope and at least we have the bank of allogeneic mitochondria so that's our first step 
in scaling up. And I mentioned CAR T cells, which is also a personalized cell therapy versus in hematopoietic stem cells. Our process is only 24 hours versus like a two week or 10 days of process for CAR T. So we are already doing better. We can automate this process. It doesn't fully require working in a GMP and we are working on that. Just an instrument that with the bottom, you can push and start the process. Still, it will take 24 hours probably, but we are working on that as well. So we are already thinking about the next stages. And one thing to remember, although we are targeting only the hematopoietic stem cells, what we have shown in our paper is that, that, that there is continuous transfer of mitochondria between cells. Most of what we see is still in the hematopoietic stem cells. There are nanotubes uh, formed between cells and there are vesicles that transfer mitochondria. And that could, again, but let's remember 300 trillion cells okay we're not going to replace all of them so there is another effect the immune system that is now being fixed has a systemic effect by itself and what we observe is actually when we treat an aged mouse with a mitochondrial augmentation technology we see that the kidney gene expression profile changes from the old towards the younger. This is the treated group, okay? It goes towards the younger phenotype. And more specifically, of course, we are interested in the mitochondrial genes. So you see that the gene expression profile of the mitochondrial encoded and nuclear encoded genes is changing towards the younger phenotype. They also have some brain changes. You can see this um, open field test. They walk more in the center relative to the periphery and they walk longer. This is in aged animals. So we see a systemic effect, even though we target just the hematopoietic stem cells. I, I don't have a question, just a comment. I love your energy, your enthusiasm, and I like the name of the uh, company because in Spanish, it's you my know, girlfriend. yes, it means, yeah, exactly. my girlfriend. So beautiful, beautiful. So keep Thank on working, you. fantastic. So time for another question. Thank you. <laughs> so we have about time for one more here. Yes, how important is it to have a homogeneous haplotype like from your mother? Excellent question. So um, usually we are only inheriting our mother's mitochondria and we did try initially to keep the mother as the donor because it's a syngenaic uh, donor. What we see in our, and we have tons of experience already running, that it doesn't really matter. To get our biological effect, it doesn't really matter. But in the system that we have tested, we don't see persistence of this exogenous mitochondrial DNA in the cells. So it's an excellent question. And we'll have to continue to monitor that, maybe in diseased or in patients, it is different. But we don't have a clear question to that. Currently, the biological effect is achieved even with a different haplotype, yes. One last comment, if I may, we can do something about our mitochondria. Yesterday, someone said we, it has to start early. It has to start early. We have to monitor our mitochondria. We know what makes us feel well. We know what we eat. It makes us feel bad. We know how we feel after we exercise, we yoga, or we sing out loud. This is because we bring so much energy, so much oxygen, oxygen so much energy to our cells. This is fundamental. And when we take drugs, monitor those drugs and make sure that they are not toxic to your mitochondria. There is data available. My father was 79 years old, completely healthy. He had no issues, never took even a single drug. He had epileptic seizure once. He started receiving valproic acid. That drug almost killed him. It caused him to be completely paralyzed. He couldn't even hold a spoon. It was just a drug. Four months later, we realized it was a drug. There are next generation drugs for epileptic seizures, okay? No adverse events, guys. He's back on his feet. He sings, he prays. It, this is so important. I have no idea why they continue to sell these drugs, but I give this to you. Just make sure that they are not toxic, okay? It's controllable. Thank you. Thank you.